All right. Greetings, fellow civil engineer. Today we're going to go over three tips to pass the civil PE exam structural depth section. Let's get right into it. Tip number one, know your references. So the NCES syllabus gives you a comprehensive list of references you'll need for the depth section. You can answer just about all the questions in this section using these books. The civil engineering reference manual isn't nearly as useful for this part though you may open it uh, to answer a few of the basic questions. So let's go over the references, starting from the top. The Ashto Bridge Design Manual, this guy right here. Uh, you can buy it online in loose leaf format, but it's super expensive and consists of enough pages to fill three three-ring binders. Due to its price and unwieldy size, most people opt not to bring it. I sure didn't. If you can borrow a copy from work, and you know how to use it, then you can go ahead. Otherwise, don't bother. I guessed on all the Ashto Bridge design questions and I still passed. So, next one is IDC. This one is straightforward. It asks you a lot of trivia questions about building codes and the construction process. These are qualitative, not quantitative questions for the most part. So, just tab the all the sections and you should be good to go. ASC 7-10, the instructions are straightforward but they're complicated. You'll have to flip through several sheets and various charts to find the information you need. Be sure to research the snow, wind, and seismic loads to familiarize yourself with all the factors that go into making a calculation. Focus on the exceptions to the rules because they will try to trip you up with those. They uh, do go into minutia, so know where to find everything and how to calculate everything, and you should be good to go. ACI 318, this reference contains plenty of quantitative and qualitative information, so you'll have equations and charts, but also information about the properties of concrete. Uh, the newest incarnation as of this video is the 2014 version shown here. It consists of the standards and the explanations for the standards uh, printed side by side. I would say tab all the chapters and also highlight all the charts and all the equations and make sure that you know how to use them. And the steel construction manual. This one is tough to navigate through because it is so long. There's tons of information in there. It's impossible to effectively use without tabbing. So make sure that you know how to use all the charts that go into design. And also remember, the steel manual is as much a textbook as it is a reference. The sections in the back have step-by-step -step instructions for compression, tension, and flexural design. So be sure to tap those and know how to use them. The NDS uh, wood construction manual, you'll get this as part of a packet that has four manuals with it, but there's only one design manual and that's the one that you use. So it, like the steel manual, it has tons of information. So make sure that you tab and highlight every section that references a specific design factor. Make sure that you know how to use all the tables and charts that are in the back and make sure that you know how to uh, calculate all the effective lengths and know how to what to do in various design situations. The OSHA manual, this one is actually published online and you can download a PDF, take it to a print shop and have it print out a spiral bound book, save some money that way. Um, contains a lot of just rules and regulations. If you tab all the major sections and know where to find everything, you should be good to go. PCI design handbook, uh, I didn't really study pre-cast and pre-stressed concrete that much. It's a nice looking book, but I literally did not open it during the exam. So unless you know how to use this manual and all its charts, I would suggest not even bringing it. And finally, the masonry design manual. The biggest surprise for me from the exam was the amount of masonry questions. I never took a masonry class, but fortunately most of the problems were simple and straightforward. I barely skimmed this reference, but I did tap the chapters. In hindsight, it would have been very beneficial to go through and memorize all the important bits of information them being all the definitions and the equations would be important for now for masonry. But anyways, when it comes to references, keep in mind the following. Tabbing is important, but it won't take the place of studying. 
You'll have time to look up crucial information during the exam, but you won't have time to learn unfamiliar material. Tab every, measure, every major section and ensure that you understand every chart and every equation and, and how to apply it during the exam. Um, next is the reference they're referencing may not be the one you're thinking of. One example, when I took the exam, we had a question about the acceptable height of a masonry wall. I searched all over the masonry manual and found nothing. Afterwards, I discovered the answer was in the OSHA manual. So there's that. Studying your references will help you more than doing practice problems. Some engineers may disagree with this assertion, but it was definitely true for me. Problems can help you get used to the format and presentation of the exam, but do the high volume of information available, you'll unlikely find problems that are exactly like the ones on the exam. Tip number two, the questions vary in terms of difficulty. You'll get to some questions and think, why the heck is this even on the exam? It's too easy. Other questions will have you scratching your head because you can't make heads or tails of it. In fact, when I took the exam, I saw a handful of questions about subjects I had never seen before. Of course, the questions are all worth the same number of points. So it's important to go through and complete the easiest questions first. If you're unsure of the answer, mark it and move on. The folks who write this exam are trying to trick you into wasting your time. I would suggest marking all of the questions that you have no clue how to solve and do them last. Remember, even if you guess, you still have a 25% chance of getting it right. Use the process of elimination to your advantage. NCES won't publish the cutoff scores for the exam, but it hovers around 56 out of 80. If you have at least 28 questions that you know you got right on both sections, then you have a clear path to victory. Also, after the exam is done, don't obsessively check the NCES website for your results because they'll send you an email when the answers are posted. And finally, tip number three, the aforementioned references aren't your only resources. Ta-da! So when I took the exam, I used some additional manuals that helped quite a bit. These, uh, so the references you have will have, will have pages and pages of raw data and charts and graphs. But these manuals that are published by PPI put a lot of that information in a more practical context. You can also bring at any textbook or even handwritten notes as long as they're secured in a three-ring binder and to the exam. So that is all the advice I have for you now. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me and let me know what's up. That's all for now. Bye.